Why uh, why this universe event? This is also the first time Dan and I are recording the podcast together. We've only ever done this remotely before because we started in COVID and I live in New York. So very exciting moment. So we thank haven't you. been at the same place at the same time since since before we started yeah. the podcast. Yeah. Three three years ago? Yeah. 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 All right. so a very special moment. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, so we are going to have a great conversation today with two very special guests. Um, so we're going to be talking about life in the universe, uh, specifically intelligent life, right? So we're going to be talking both about finding intelligent life on other planets. You know, we have one special guest who's going to be focusing on that. And we're going to be talking about life here on Earth and maybe the biggest risk that we face as a species to the survival on on Earth, you know, and that's going to maybe illuminate a little bit about the risks of just intelligent life developing on any planet and maybe illuminate why we haven't had contact with intelligent life, right? So we're going to get maybe a little sci-fi, but but very grounded in the science. Yeah. So Dan, would you like to introduce our special guest? Sure. Come on up. Our first guest today is Diana Powell. Diana is an expert on the formation and evolution of extrasolar planets, including things like protoplanetary disks and planetary atmospheres. She got her PhD from UC Santa Cruz back in 2021. And until recently, she was a Sagan fellow at Harvard, but I'm happy to say she just moved to the University of Chicago, where she's a new assistant professor in the astronomy and astrophysics department. Welcome, Diana. And second guest is Dan Holtz. Dan is also professor of astronomy and astrophysics at the University of Chicago. Um, he's an expert on the theory of general relativity, and he specializes in ways that we can do astrophysics and cosmology using gravitational waves. He's also a member of the Science and Security Board of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, the organization that sets the hands of the famous doomsday clock. Welcome, Dan, to Why This Universe. So I'm just going to kind of set the table a bit for the rest of the discussion. So in the 1960s, early 1960s, this astronomer, radio astronomer, Frank Drake, came up with this equation that we now call the Drake equation, which he designed so that we could estimate how many planets out there might have intelligent or technologically advanced life. Of course, there was a lot of stuff that we didn't know or astronomers didn't know at that time that we know today. And uh, therefore, we might change our estimations as time goes on as we learn more. But at least at the time, if you made some reasonable assumptions, it looked like there should be a lot of technologically advanced life in our galaxy. Which leads to a bit of a paradox called the Fermi paradox that we don't see any evidence of this life. So um, let's start with some questions for you, Diana. Um, maybe for our audience, both in the room and, and listening to the podcast, can you start by just summarizing what the Drake equation is, how it works, and what Frank Drake meant for it to do? Yeah, so the Drake equation, um, I have it written here, so it's still something we think about, but I wanted all the all the equation uh, pieces. So it's a, an equation of lots of things that we don't know. So there's quite a few factors, they're multiplied together, and it's supposed to give us the number of, spe of different uh, species of life that we can communicate. So the number of alien civilizations we can talk to. And so there's a bunch of variables. Um, at the time he wrote the equation, we knew functionally none of them. Now we know a few of them, but there's still half of the equation that becomes totally uncertain. Um, so it's something that astronomers are still thinking about, some question that was posed decades ago that still matters. So what are the uncertain and certain parts of the Drake equation? Like what are the parts that we now have locked down and what are the parts that are the wild west? Yep, so one of the first um, variables is the star formation rate. And we have a pretty good idea of the star formation rate in the Milky Way galaxy, a pretty good idea of the number of stars in the galaxy. Um, so that part's reasonably well known. Then the next one is the fraction of stars with planets. And that's also now well known. So we know that most stars have planets, um, somewhere between one to three planets on average per star. So we know there's plenty of planets in the Milky Way. Then there's the number of planets that can support life per star with planets. So this one is where we start to get a little bit more uncertain. Um, but we know from things like the solar system that probably lots of planets can host life. I guess I should say the solar system slash extremophile life here on Earth. So we now know that life can live in lots of very crazy places. And so there should be lots of places where it can live. Um, but then after this point, the equation starts to become totally unknown. So then it's the fraction of planets that can host life that do host life. We don't know that at all. 
um, than the fraction where intelligent life develops. We also don't know this. And then the fraction that developed communication, we definitely don't know that. And then the length of communication time, also totally unknown. So kind of half we have some guesses at, something that Drake didn't have, but half we know nothing. So let's kind of bracket this. Let's say I'm a life optimist, okay? And I think pretty much every planet that is, you know, potentially habitable, it can support things like liquid water and whatever, all those places are going to have life. Then how many planets should be sending out signals right now? From, from technologically sophisticated intelligent life? Yeah, that's a great question. And I'm a life optimist, so I like how you couched it. Um, <laughs> but so even if all the planets that can host life do host life, we don't know how many will be sending out signals. So here on Earth, we have life. We like to call ourselves intelligent. We're sending out some form of signals, but signals that we could not hear from. So if there's another Earth orbiting the closest star to us, we cannot hear us. So we already can't detect life like us. So we're talking about something already more advanced than us that can send out more advanced signals that aren't lost in space. Um, so we already have no idea. And then I guess if we tried to put a lower bracket on it, there's really no way to do that. We The, the chance that life emerges could be 1% or 10 to the minus 6 or 10 to the minus 20. We, we have no lower bound on that, right? Yeah, no lower bound. Although I think there's reason to believe that life kind of forms when chemical conditions are are right. So it might be a more of a time scale argument than anything. Um, so, so people like to put bounds where it's like, once you have a certain temperature, it's really a size scale of the planet and how quickly things can communicate so that you can form life. So it might be more of like, I know that life probably is not forming in giant molecular clouds where time scales communicate are really long just because distances are so large. But maybe on something like, even Pluto, we don't know for sure because it's small enough. You can imagine things talking. Pluto was a bad example. Pluto's pretty cold. Something kind of warmer than Pluto. Okay. Um, imagine that there is. Yeah. I think Dan has something to say. Oh, sorry, you... Dan. It's true. Yeah. So thanks for doing this. <laughs> yeah. I just on the lower bound, we do have a lower bound, which is there's one planet in the yeah. universe, <laughs> but that's a pretty small number. <laughs> yeah, that's but, right. But you know, it is a low. We our existence is is a data point. Yeah. So it's not zero. It's not a perfect. It's not zero. zero. That's right. right. And and if we didn't have our one example, it could have been zero, right? I mean, it, if, if you just... There'd be no one to ask. Yeah. yeah if yeah. you told me the laws that of physics of this universe and nothing yeah. else, yeah. it could have been the zero. The question of how uncertain we are. Yeah. But, but why the universe at all? So, the, <laughs> like, if you told me the physics of this universe, why why are there planets at all right I now? I like the sound of that. Why this universe? <laughs> yeah. Like that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that came up without me thinking about the podcast <laughs> title. Organic. I'm kind of wondering too, so in general, when we talk about intelligent life, especially in the context of the Drake equation, how are we defining intelligent versus, you know, just random bacteria and stuff? Like that's a clear distinction between like bacteria not intelligent, but are we mostly just talking about a civilization that could communicate with us or is there another way to think about it? Yeah, I think that's what the Drake equation is getting at. So it's if we can talk to life, extrasolar life. I'm I'm really interested in alien life, even if we can't communicate. But a lot of people who care deeply about aliens, they want it to be more tangible. You know, they want to talk talk to aliens, which would be awesome. I'm also totally down for that. So I'd say intelligence is the desire to communicate um, on interstellar distances. Distances. By that definition, are we an intelligent species? Yeah, we want to. We want to talk. Yeah. Okay. So let, let let's build on that. Let's say there was a planet with life very much like Earth's in the present day, how far away from us could that planet be before we would be aware that there was a tel intelligent life on it? So there's some Earth, some number of miles or light years or whatever away. What's our kind of the maximum distance that we would be aware of that planet from? Yeah, I think we're still talking mostly solar system distances. Like occasionally you get some interesting papers that are talking about like, is there intelligent life in the asteroid belt? And are we looking for cities there? Not the asteroid belt, the Kuiper belt. So further Pluto-ish distances. Um, I, I, I don't think those papers hold any real stock in reality, but that is about the scale where it would be difficult to know. I mean, in terms of just generally life, the solar system, whether it hosts life, is something we don't know, even as close as Mars or Venus. Um, so with intelligent life, yeah, we're not even the next star over. So somewhere on solar system scales, Kuiper Belt, maybe Oort Cloud, but that's basically another star at that point. So programs like SETI and things wouldn't be aware of an Earth-like civilization on a nearby uh, solar system? 
No, I don't think so. I think they would say not also. So when they talk about like how much has SETI probed for intelligent life, I remember a talk by Jill Tarter where she said it's like we've looked at a glass of water and the universe is, or the nearby universe is an ocean. Okay. So we barely probed probed space at all. Um, there are some people that like to to think about flashing lights or detecting flashing lights on some of the closest stars, but no, I think that it'd be totally feasible that Earth's around Proxima Centauri and we can't hear it. Okay. And what do the prospects of increasing that uh, sensitivity look like for the next 10, 20, 30 years? Yeah. So right now we have the James Webb Space Telescope that doesn't do so much at increasing the sensitivity of nearby Earth, sadly. Um, but I think once we start looking at telescopes like GMT, so that's like, well, hopefully like 10, 15, 20 year times. So that's a giant Magellan telescope. Giant Magellan right? telescope. Um, you Chicago is a partner in this. That's when we can start looking more directly at some of these like nearby Earth-like planets, and then maybe we can see things more directly. So maybe even looking at the surface, that's very optimistic, but then we could see intelligent life more clearly. And if they're sending out signals, hopefully detect that. All right. So I've got one more question for you, Diane, and then we're going to transition over to Dan here. But uh, so around the same time that Frank Drake was writing down his equation, uh, there's this famous story I don't it might be apocryphal I don't know but you know Enrico Fermi and some of his collaborators Edward Teller and people sitting down at the cafeteria at Los Alamos coming up with this thing that become known as the Fermi paradox can you tell our listeners the basis of that and how people working in exoplanets like you are view it today yeah so the Fermi paradox is if planets are so abundant and life on those planets is so are so abundant then and intelligent life should be so common. Um, why aren't we seeing it? Why why aren't there aliens zooming around right now? And I think there's a few reasons uh, to be skeptical of this. So now modern astronomers, well, it de depends a little bit on who you're talking to. Um, there are astronomers right now that are looking for UFOs on, on Earth. So I think there's reason to think like maybe it is all around. We just haven't seen it yet. So that's a big answer to the Drake equation that I subscribe to. Like I said, we barely probed the nearby universe. Um, and even now, we just have the capability of seeing things like interstellar comets and asteroids. So maybe life's been zooming around and we haven't been looking very well. I mean, we definitely haven't been looking very well. Um, if there are any funding organizations listening, uh, we want more ways to, to look at the universe. Um, but then I also think there's reasons to like fundamental physical reasons like space is huge traversing space is really hard light seems to be a finite barrier it would take us years even tra of traveling at close to light speed to get to the nearest star so even if there's intelligent life everywhere there's reasons to think that there's some just really hard physical barriers to zooming around or to communicating across large distances like space is really 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 big um but yeah i also think I'll I'll touch on one point last point of the Drake equation to be optimistic before we move to Dan because I there's lots of reasons to be pessimistic but you know humans we we're intelligent um we might not be around too long but there have been human humans other humans not homo sapiens but homo erectus that lasted for millions of years 2 million years before we probably killed them all but you can imagine uh, intelligent life sticking around for longer than us so <laughs> my one plug for being more of a life intelligent life optimist you're you're a life optimist in more than one axis I, I'm, I, I, yeah. am, I am i might be in the first axis but maybe not in the latter <laughs> yeah. all right should we transition yeah yeah all right dan uh tell us what the doomsday clock is yeah i, I should say i'm a little worried about this life optimist life pessimistic <laughs> divide <laughs> I mean, that's um, why we brought you together. That's right. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm going to try not Create to Create some tension. Yeah, well, I don't think of myself as a pessimist, but realism, pessimism, sometimes they bleed into one another, which is part of the problem. So, yeah, okay. So the, the doomsday clock, which as it happens is just a block away, the actual physical doomsday clock, um, is this... Uh, a symbol that was created by the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. Uh, it was created in 1947. And what it does is it it's supposed to capture the sense of how close we are to doomsday, where doomsday is, uh, roughly speaking, the end of civilization. And uh, in particular, uh, the end of civilization by our own hand. So a technological end of civilization. And so this organization, the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, was founded in 45. Uh, people like Oppenheimer and Einstein were involved. And 
the reason it was founded is because scientists at that time realized that uh, we are now entered the atomic age. There were nuclear weapons and they were terrified. And even back then, when there had only been a few weapons, they were fission weapons, not fusion weapons, so very weak by modern standards. Um, even then, they could sort of see forward and see that there was this path where it would end up in an arms race where the US and the USSR would each develop ever more powerful weapons and many of these weapons. And basically, if you just ran the normal movie forward, eventually there'd be a world war and would wipe ourselves out. And that was clear already to them in 1945. So in 1945, 1947, they were already envisioning these like megaton scale weapons. Yes, that... there was already an awareness that if you could do fission, you could probably make fusion bombs mm. and you could just continue to scale them up. And there's no limit to how powerful you can make those bombs. So when the clock was established in 1947, where was the clock initially set? Yeah, so it was originally set as completely arbitrary. It was set to seven minutes to midnight. And that was just because it looked good. It was established by Marta Langsdorf, who was an artist. She was married to one of uh, a member of the bulletin, a, a physicist. And, you know, it was just meant to be a symbol. And she thought this was catchy for a cover. And, and then, you know, we started to move it. Originally, it wasn't even intended to be moved. It was just the symbol. Oh. That really answers one of my questions, which is, I feel like it started so close to Doomsday. We didn't give ourselves a chance. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, and that is a problem. I mean, that we are close in some sense, but you know, it must be said, it kind of moves around. And now seven minutes to midnight to me sounds very far away from midnight. <laughs> We're now in 90 seconds, which is the closest in our we've ever been on the clock. And so this organization thinks this is the most dangerous moment in the history, really in the history of civilization. Um, you know, this is the closest we we are to annihilating ourselves or really destroying civilization and uh so we're pretty concerned but we've been much further away we've been at 12 minutes to midnight um and you know that was at the end of the cold war things were looking up you know we've we've you know it kind of moves around so yeah. are the factors that drive the bulletin's placement of that the the, the hands of the clock driven almost entirely by nuclear threats or are there other considerations they balance? Yeah, for the first few decades, it was entirely nuclear. Uh, that was the main concern. And that was the only way we knew of confidently that we could really end humanity. Um, starting in the 80s and formally in the 90s uh, and early 2000s, we started to more directly consider climate change. Okay. So uh, that's been something we've been talking about and worried about for a while. And now it's also part of the clock setting. It's something that we uh, talk about a lot. It's another technological thing. It's something we're doing to our planet and we have grave concerns. And I think anyone that's read the news over the last few months can see that, you know, bad things are happening and they're only going to get worse. So um, I think just to clarify, there might be some people who hear this and they think what Dan's talking about here is the planet getting hot enough that, you know, human beings can't live on it. I don't think that's what you mean. No, no. So that, that. Yeah. So thanks. Yeah. So, so that's an important, so there are different things you could mean by midnight. Uh, uh, I, the way I think about it, at least, I mean, it is true. If all humans were, you know, wiped out, uh, then that would also constitute midnight. But I'm also just concerned about what I would call the collapse of civilization. If we're unable to have a podcast like this and I'll sit here in a nice room and have a discussion, if things have gone to the point where that's no longer possible on Earth, I would also count that as, as midnight. And um, if many people on Earth, if their standard of living plummets, if we have mass starvation, if, you know, even beyond the scales that we're already starting to see, you know, at some point that slides into midnight. And do these different kinds of risks we're talking about here interact with each other? Do they compound each other? Yeah, so that's our main concern at the moment. So so the most direct risk, the one that's probably easiest for everyone to think about is the nuclear risk. So, you know, right now at this moment, uh, you know, Putin or Biden could push a button 
And if they do, within 30 minutes, pretty you know, civilization is over. Um, at least half a billion people would die instantly, and then many hundreds of million from there, and all the major metropol metropolises would be gone. And uh, I think most everyone would agree that would be kind of a setback for humanity. Uh, then you throw in nuclear winter, and it could really be devastating for for decades. You know, recovery. It's hard, it's hard to know what happens next. So that's a very clear doomsday scenario. The question is, well, okay, climate is a little slower, but um, we would claim what is happening with climate makes this nuclear doomsday scenario much more likely. We're already seeing uh, huge instabilities globally. Um, you know, you have uh, refugees, you uh, climate refugees. Uh, these put pressures on governments. The governments respond in certain ways. Um, citizens respond in certain ways. There are increasing wars over resources. There'll be wars over water. When you just run this movie forward, it's very easy to see how, as as the climate gets worse, and it will get worse no matter what we do. At this point, you know the, what we're trying to do is make things a little better years from now. It takes a while for things. So even if we stop all emissions now, it's going to get worse for a while. And as it gets worse, all these other things will also get worse. And and that's our main concern, is that these inst instabilities will cause someone to push a button. Just, you know, there's an increasing pressure. And and all it, if it's really all it takes is one person to be freaked out, for the citizens to be clamoring, just do something, you know, it, it, it's problematic. No, it's dark. Um, <laughs> I want to, I want to ask about how this weighs on you. But first, I want to ask too. So we've talked about the nuclear threat and climate change, but I was wondering if like AI is also considered a threat at this point. Can you see like a movie where AI ends us by now with the way our technology is going? Yeah. So so AI is a threat and it's something we also talk about. I think. We we have a general category now, which we call misinformation and disinformation, which we've been very worried about for a few years um, as a threat. And again, you know, disinformation in and of itself won't end civilization, but it can enable these other things. It can make it more likely that, for example, there'll be a nuclear exchange. It can make it less likely that we address climate change and therefore further destabilizing civilization. So in that sense, I think misinformation and disinformation are a major issue. And I mean, as you're very familiar, this is something the world is still grappling with and is far from solving. And AI, one of the clear things AI does is it makes that even worse. It's it really it like turbocharges disinformation. And and so that's a great concern. There are these additional concerns which we think about, I think, you know, most of us within the community at the Doomsday Clock, you know, the, the members of the Science and Security Board aren't terrified of the kind of Terminator type movie where the machines take over. Um, it's a possibility. I don't think anyone is ready to completely rule it out, but um, I think there are other things to focus on, at least in the shorter term. It makes sense that people keep paying attention. We shouldn't, you know, we, we shouldn't completely dismiss it. And in particular, I just want to point out, there is this interesting analogy for me, which is the nuclear scientists and the whole point of the bulletin was nuclear scientists you know, people that had spent their time working on these weapons warning the public warning society warning policymakers these are dangerous we need to think about these and and you know we helped develop them we know where this might go please you know go slowly you know let's 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 be very deliberate the way that you know, we need to change our ways of thinking some in the AI community are saying exactly the same thing. And so I hesitate to dismiss when you have the people working on the technology saying, we're terrified mm -hmm. and we think you should go slow. I, I'm not, I, I hesitate to completely dismiss them as crackpots. Like they're, they're telling us something. It's complicated. They have their own interests. Like there's, you know, but nonetheless, you know, fundamentally, these are the experts and a good, you know, some good fraction of them are worried. So we should probably be wary too. The thing that keeps me up at night in some sort of medium to long term is I imagine with reasonable extrapolations into the future, there'll be some point 30, 50, 100 years in the future where 
there are machines that exist that can do literally everything we can do better. And um, Diana, you mentioned something about Homo habilis before, and uh, they didn't stick around once there was a different species that did almost everything better than them. Um, and I don't know exactly how that plays out, but I don't see in the kind of game theory and economy and kind of global competition resources that will exist in that future any way we come out ahead. Am I missing something there? Yeah, I, I mean, I, this is, so I get to be the optimist now. So, so that, that's nice. I'm not oh, usually pessimist the optimist. Thing, the pessimist. Yeah. Um, so it, could, it, you know, one way to think about it is it could go either way. It could be this pessimistic scenario where we're competing for resources with the AIs and, and we might lose. Um, but the optimistic version is, you know, these are just tools. And, and if they're used to make our lives better, they, they could be phenomenal. I mean, they could help us, you know, cure diseases. They could help us improve productivity. They could help us address climate change. There are all these things that they could help us with. And so you could say, well, you know, I mean, cars came along. Cars go much faster than we could ever run. But, um, you know, we're still around. And they help us, and you know they've aside from the whole climate change issue, you know they've helped move society, and there are lots of examples of that technology helping. And so I think this does get to the core question of the bulletin, which is this belief that technology can help, that technology can make the world a better place for humans, and that's a good thing, and we want technology, but it also has this downside, and there are also threats. And you just want to be mindful of that and be careful. And if we are, and I hate to use the word enlightened, but if we're careful about the way we do this, you know, we could be heading into a golden age. Yeah, no, that's, a, that's a good point. I feel like it's it's important to kind of talk about the potential positive futures, right? At least, you know, to kind of convince ourselves to work towards that, you know, not get got too pessimistic. Um, so I wanted to ask just like, for you, you're thinking about this a lot, you know, like it's weighing on you the question of how we might destroy ourselves as humanity. How does this affect you? Do you feel like, is it something that keeps you up at night on a regular basis? Can you like compartmentalize? <laughs> yeah, it's, I, it's, it's gotten, to be honest, harder. It used to be, for some reason, it was easy for me to comp compartmentalize. And so a few years ago, I would do the bulletin stuff and would set the clock and and go home and be fine. And for some reason lately, I think in part because of the situation in Ukraine and the increasing clear evidence of climate change, um, it's getting hard. I mean, to be honest, it's getting harder. Like it's it's and it's part of the reason I'm doing these things and not you know spending all my time thinking about black holes is because I I think it's important. Like we should all be doing what we can to try to you know make a difference because if we don't do anything, uh, I don't think it's going to end up, it's going to end up well. And I mean, this gets back to this issue of the Drake equation. And, you know, so I agree with everything that I was saying. And, you know, it's the, the one thing I would say is, you know, one way to think about this is that one term at the end, which is, you know, how long civilization lasts. And I think this is kind of part of why you put us together is, you know, that's, that is this one term where if you make that very long, then at, we should start to see people. Civilizations have been around on other planets for easily billions of years. So that's plenty of time to get over here. Even, uh, you know, if you're going much slower than the speed of light, no one has shown up. Okay, that could be surprising. And it might be civilizations don't last that long. W one reason for that is We've really had in this sort of, you know, the ability to go into space, the ability to send powerful signals, all of that is maybe 50 years old. Mm -hmm. And I would say that we made it through the last 50 years. Uh, people have, you know, people who were involved in these decisions say, you know, maybe there was a one in three, one in two chance would make it through. If you look at the Cuban Missile Crisis, if you look at all the close calls we've had, it's not likely. It's certainly, you know, there's a greater than one in 10 chance would blow ourselves up if you ran the movie again. And if every 
you know, 50 years, you have to flip a coin and hope you get heads again. Exactly. That's a very precarious. We all know story. that's not going to work long term. And and so, you know, you go from a billion years to a few hundred years, maybe 500 years, then this would kind of explain it. So let me put this in what you're saying in context for, for our listeners. So I take the Drake equation. I take all the things we know, put those numbers in. And I say, well, I think most of the potentially habitable places will eventually or have at some point had you know, technologically sophisticated life. And let's let's say I think all those civilizations last for a million years, just to pick a, a number. OK, then the Milky Way should harbor something like a million technologically advanced civilizations. And that's just not what our galaxy looks like. That's what the Fermi paradox is. It's like, where are those million? Why, why aren't they all zipping around and you know, terraforming their environments and doing all sorts of dramatic things that we wouldn't be able to miss. So there are several different would-be solutions. Maybe life isn't as common, maybe technology isn't as common or intelligence, or maybe, and this is called the great filter, is as soon as we get in the state we're finding ourselves in on Earth right now, we tend to destroy ourselves. Yeah. And so maybe instead of a million years, it's a hundred years or it's, you know, whatever, something like this. And I will just say, eventually, hopefully, we won't be able to miss. We would be able to miss terraforming civilizations right now. Oh, if there are a bunch of Dyson spheres being built around stars, we probably know about that, right? Well, there's some weird light curves. People posit Dyson spheres. We throw it out. We still don't know. Exocomets, Dyson spheres. We don't know. We like this optimism. It's good. <laughs> All right. We should explain what a Dyson sphere is. Uh, Diana. So a Dyson sphere, as you could imagine, harnessing the... so. We're an energy limited society, um, but the sun has a lot of energy. You can imagine harnessing this with some giant mega structure around the sun. Um, people call it a Dyson sphere. It could look at particular different ways. Um, and people have claimed that we might be seeing this around one very odd star that has a weird light curve. So it brightens and dims in weird ways. Um, it's hard to explain it with things. People say swarms of exocomets. Nobody really believes Dyson spheres, but just it, it could be. Uh, we just think that's weird because we don't know. But so right. even if there are Dyson spheres running around, we still don't know. Okay. Okay. So here's some questions for the whole the whole panel, right? All four of us. All right. Um, how do you think these risks that are faced by humanity uh, shed light on this last term in the Drake equation? Like the it as you consider the risks that we face, the sort of stuff Dan was talking about, does it change? your kind of expectation, your guess of what this duration of a typical civilization might look like? Do you, Does it make you think it might be shorter or otherwise change your estimation? And maybe I'll just add on to the question a bit, if this helps um, tie the two threads too. Like, do you think that other intelligent life on other planets would face similar threats than mm. to the ones that we, we have today? Yeah, when I think about, I mean, there's also other threats that creep me, keep me up at night that now like single actor players could be involved in things like CRISPR, like, oh, I just want to change all the algae sure. in the ocean and change the climate that way. I mean, a, a grad student could do that now. Um, <laughs> Don't get ideas. <laughs> I mean, they all know if you're a grad student working on CRISPR, you know. So I do think, yeah, I mean, at some at some point we became really good at figuring out the laws of the universe. And I would say that point's probably only a few hundred years old. And every it, it seems to be an exponential process. We are getting better and better at this all the time. Like what we know now versus what we knew just a few generations ago is really staggering. It is mind blowing. I mean, if you just check out of science for a year and come back in, it's mind blowing. Um, yeah, I'd say probably most intelligent life does get there. They do figure out laws of the universe. Like we are lucky to live in a universe that has laws. As a scientist, we're lucky. It's really fun as an intelligent species. We're still lucky, but maybe it means that, yeah, you hit this point where you figure out laws and you can alter them. Um, yeah, I do think, though, life also has an inherent desire to survive. Like we're seeing how that we know that on an individual level, like most people, most animals will try to survive. We'll see how that plays out on a societal civilization level. I think that might change that from being a coin flip every 50 years to being more concerted, like someone didn't press that button, you know, Um hopefully more people don't press the button and i think that there's reasons to think like some people do wild things and it's very concerning that you only need one person now but maybe maybe society does want to survive maybe it has the same thing that an individual human has so yeah i think most people probably most intelligent life faces this risk um they could be fundamentally different from humans and our desire to push buttons and change things uh and a lot of how our behavior is is structured is due to societal norms 
So you could imagine, like, there's been plenty of taboos that humans won't cross, depending on what society has said we should do. But yeah, I think that uh, there's every reason to be very concerned and to be concerned that this is a universal outcome of life that gets too smart. Yeah, I, I mean, so I, I like to, and I can't tell if, again if it's optimistic or pessimistic, but I, you know, I feel like we're not that special in some sense. That, you know, I mean, we've okay, we've evolved, we've figured all this stuff out. We now have a handle on the laws of physics. I think the laws of physics as far as we know, are the same throughout the universe. So if there's some other, you know, intelligent life out there, eventually they're going to figure out the laws of physics. At some point, you figure out how to change, manipulate biology, which is something we do worry about uh, and, and with the uh, bulletin. And, you know, you end up manipulating nuclear energy. I mean, that's just something that's available to you. So it's hard to imagine that that wouldn't be a natural. I mean, all these things are going to happen. So the only question is, are we unusual? I mean, here we are as a civilization, and we've almost done our, I mean, we've only had the technology for a little while, you know, maybe 50 years, and we've come pretty close a few times. We don't, you look at sort of the discourse around climate change. I mean, we are using our atmosphere as an open sewer. We all, you know, scientists have been saying this is happening, that all these terrible things are going to, you know, show up if we don't stop and now that stuff is happening and uh, i mean realistically if you look at the you know kind of actions of the people in in power they're not particularly encouraging at least there are lots of words now but the, the actions the effects of the fossil fuel special intro i mean it's it's pretty depressing okay so you can easily spin yourself try not to be pessimistic all i'm saying is I, I'm going to say we're not that unusual, and therefore it's easy to say um, most other whatever life looks like, they're going to have control of the same things. And so the question is, are they going to be so different from us that they're all going to be kumbaya and, you know, we're not going to develop weapons? Maybe. I don't. I don't know. But as a flip side to that, just this question of where is everyone, one of the explanations for that is that planets develop all this technology, civilizations out there have this technology, and they decide that they're not going to, they're happy, and they're not going to go explore, colonize, uh, waste their energy sending signals out or sending probes, and they're just going to do their own thing and retreat. And so the ultimate civilizations, the asymptote might actually be that you, they disappear from the universe rather than go out and populate the universe which to us sounds foreign, but that might be really the sign of enlightenment in some sense. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure that's the answer, but you know, it is one possible, very optimistic answer to where is everyone? I think I'm going to express some skepticism <laughs> about that last point, Dan. I, first of all, I can't think of any biological organism that has foregone uh, a resource um, and just decided to stay where they are when they could access some other useful resource. And also just the game theory, the problem, if there was like some variation and some groups wanted it and some didn't, they would take it. And, you know, it, it seems like very unstable to me to a situation where like, Oh, that stuff out there. We're going to pass. Yeah. Let me, I just further say, so I agree. I think this would be the difference between intelligent life and normal, like you get to a certain level of intelligence and you choose not to do that. Mm. That would be the claim. And if I really want, I'm not advocating this, but if I really want to push it, I would say, well, okay, let's, I think you're right. There's probably a diversity of types of civilizations. The one that, the ones that can't get along blow themselves up. Mm -hmm. And then the ones that are left, you know, kind of yeah. do their own thing and retreat. And maybe they're all still around, but you know they're not going to mess with us. That's a good point. We look like bad news. It's, it's right. true for us, right? This is why you do the work with the doomsday clock. We, we can choose. We can choose to not do that, these things. For sure, I believe that we can choose. <laughs> yeah. And and it's sort of a measure of you know how mature our civilization is. Mm -hmm. uh, we we make those choices and we make them all together and not have small groups making the choices for us. Yeah. No, I think it's interesting that you kind of brought up the sort of like impact that an individual can have in a destructive sense but i guess there's also like the other hand of like what does it mean to be a mature society it probably means that it's made up of mature people and maybe that is kind of the next step in 
our evolution that needs to happen next to the technological evolution, you know, of AI and everything is for us to be able to mature. <laughs> I, I do love that. So if you look at times of great evolutionary change, it is when climate's changing. It's in where there are pressures. We have a pressure now to to evolve. To And I think that's a conscious evolution. So, yeah, um, make good decisions, everyone listening. <laughs> Yeah, and I I think that's an extremely important point too. That the technology is progressing rapidly. Diana was making this point too. It's really feels if you're in the field, it's year by year. You just can't believe it. But you know our social norms, our expectations, the way we govern ourselves, that is evolving pretty slowly. Mm -hmm. And and that is the disconnect, which you know even Einstein was worried about. There's you know are we going to be able to adjust uh, in time? And I think that is, you know, one of the key questions. The question, yeah. yeah. Shalma, should we turn to the audience? Yeah. See if they have um, any questions? Yeah. So if if anyone wants to ask a question, sorry, this is kind of abrupt, but you're going to have a moment to think about it. <laughs> but you can raise your hand and I can go and pass you a mic and you can ask a question to anyone or everyone. So I see I'll, one there. I'll bring it over here. I am very curious about the calculations for finding life and specifically intelligent life in the universe. And so I was interested in the variables that you mentioned, and particularly the last one. I think that in order to have some calculation, you need data or information on these variables. Now, the, the one about life, I think we have some reasonable uh, information about. Uh, but I'm not sure about intelligent life. And so what I'm asking is, you would have to know what makes the transition from life to intelligent life. And I don't know if we, we have much information or certainly agreement of, uh, of what makes life intelligent, that transition. And so I'm asking that question, but I'm also wanna know is, are these definitions, um, of life and intelligent life written down and pretty much agreed upon by scientists like you that do these kinds of research? Yeah, great, great question. Um, I would say that we also don't really have a great idea of, of life and how abundant life is. I think we have an idea from Earth now and extremophile life that it's likely if life gets started, it's pretty robust to lots of different conditions, um, but how, how frequently it gets started is un uncertain. And then, yeah, the definition of life, I don't think scientists have agreed upon it all. I heard an astrobiologist say something like a self-replicating system. Um, yeah, we really don't know. We don't. We do not agree on what life is. Um, to a certain sense, like, I think we kind of know it when we see it. A lot of it has to do with it's something that happens out of thermodynamic equilibrium. There's ways to be really broad about the definition of life. I think when we talk about finding life, though, um, it's still the trend in the field to look for life kind of like us because we know that we're alive, um, but we don't know what what else life could be. And we haven't agreed upon a definition of life and definitely not of intelligence. I think it's for this purposes, for thinking of communication, like, yeah, something that wants to communicate, um, something that has technology, but no, this is these are not agreed upon definitions. I think that's a great point. I'm gonna ask a follow-up. So, um... I've always been fond of Schrodinger's definition of life, this idea that anything that's keeping its internal entropy low is is something you should call living. Do astrobiologists like that definition or use yeah. that definition? I think some do. I think there's actually a, quite a bit of variation in the in the field about what they like, but uh, I think that is that is a cool thing about life. Like very low entropy states, that's not normally what happens in the universe. Entropy tends to increase, uh, but we're pretty low entropy. I think I think that's nice. Mm -hmm. Looks like we have another question. I think uh, I mean, I think is it about intelligence life. So, uh, if uh, we are talking about some more advanced civilization, do you really think that they will be interested in contacting us? Because maybe for them, like we will be like bacteria, and so maybe there are like thousands of other civilizations. So, yeah. So I think that's a really good point, and I I think. Certainly advanced civilizations, if they wanted to be invisible to us, I think the assumption would be they would have no problem being invisible. Their technology is way beyond. So 
and this is why, so they could choose to be invisible to us. And, um, you know, given our current state and what we're doing, I, I think that would probably be a wise choice. So I think that could very well be part of the answer to this question is that they're out there, but even if we look, we won't find them because they're way beyond us and they don't want to be found. Um, and the flip side to that is if they wanted to be found, we would see them, which is why this whole, you know, they're here, but we can just barely see them. And every now and then we get glimpses is hard because it doesn't fall into either of those categories. And, and that's part of the reason some of these more recent discussions about UFOs are harder to follow because it's neither of these two extremes. And I'd add that it could even not be a choice, right? Like we are interested in finding bacteria. If I could talk to them like exobacteria, I totally would, but we we can't, right? Like I, I don't actually, I'm not able to talk to them even with our advanced technology. Um, so it could be the case, yeah, if we're really bacteria, they could be shouting at us and we can't hear them. Um, like we think we know the laws of physics well, but maybe they figure out everything that's like super far UV, really high energy, and they are communicating in a totally different way. They don't know how to talk to us anymore. Or gravitational waves. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're trying, you know, yeah, I think we're trying to hear the gravitational waves. Yes, exactly. It looks like we have one more question. Uh, following up on the, the issue of uh, the definitions of life, the, the people who seem to talk about that the most uh, that I've heard are the geophysicists. Yet whenever I hear panels of discussion about exoplanets and finding life and these equations, they never seem to be included. So I have to ask that question, why? I'd also like to know, when was the last time the clock was changed and why? Well, the first part of the question I should an answer, um, they're invited because they're in my department and I know them and I don't know many geophysicists. That's the real, real answer. Um, it's, it's not anything more uh, sophisticated than that. I'll leave the doomsday clock to you. Yeah. So, so we're now, as I mentioned, at 90 seconds to midnight, which is the you know closest we've ever been. And, and it was set to that uh, because of the war in Ukraine. And we've had this kind of steady over the last five years or so, We've, we've been kind of ticking forward as it were. We were at two and a half minutes and then two minutes and then a hundred seconds and, and now we're at 90 seconds. So there's been this kind of, the last few years we've, we've been ticking forward closer to midnight. Um, oh, one more question. I'll just quickly say for life. So for me personally, not uh, spending every day doing astrobiology, I do like to think about what could be explained by abiotic processes, like what's just physics, what's just chemistry. Not that we know physics and chemistry perfectly, but if there's a ready solution that can be explained that way, then I think it's hard to say that's life. Um, so the bar for what is life when in terms of detecting it in the universe is really high. So we spend a lot of time thinking about what's not life to think about what is. Hey, thanks for being here. Um, I'm afraid that my question might leave some scientific domains a little bit. Um, but I guess if we're thinking about all of these different searches for life and all of those kind of elements, from a social perspective, how do you think people would react to that? I mean, there's, and I know we don't have a lot of time for this one, but even looking at the way that people are trying to have UFO conversations right now and kind of the precarious position that science and intellectual inquiry is being put in. What what do you think, how do you think people would deal with that? So something that a very early motivator of my research actually was the idea that a very optimistic idea that, oh great, you know, human beings need an other. And if we find aliens, that can be the other and we can finally be one human species on one planet. Um, that's pretty optimistic. And then I was recently talking to a friend um, who I think is pretty well informed and I was talking about studying exoplanets and she was like oh yeah but how many planets have we found life on already and I was like none none no planets <laughs> so if people are walking around thinking that we've already found life and it hasn't changed behavior um I'm not sure I'm not sure what the impact will be yeah I mean I'm going to share that general optimism uh, you know the first part which is that <laughs> I've always I mean that would be such an amazing discovery and it's 
I mean, certainly speaking for myself, and I imagine many people, the idea that we're truly not alone in the universe, uh, th that has to give perspective. And I would hope it kind of shifts something about the way we think about ourselves. But I'm not sure which way. I mean, we we already, right now, I think many people, we think we're special. And, and you know, maybe we are the only life in the universe. And if if we are the only life in the universe, shouldn't we be more careful about not, you know, screwing ourselves up? But if there's lots of life out there, then, you know, maybe as a civilization, we take more risk. I'm not sure how to think about that. So I can imagine it going either way. I think we have another question. Hi, uh, that's super interesting, by the way. Um, I have a question regarding the clock because you mentioned before that uh, it keeps like approaching midnight, but I'm curious to know if it ever happened like in the past that it also moved backward because otherwise it kind of shows a sort of pessimistic attitude of the people that are keep pushing towards midnight, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's moved forwards and backwards over the years. And so... You know, I mean, the the hope is that we we move backwards. And and for example, at the end of the Cold War, we move backwards. There have been a few times during the Cold War where we move backwards. Um, one of the most prominent was after the Cuban Missile Crisis. I think we moved from seven minutes to twelve or something like that. I can't I can't remember the numbers, but it was what happened was um, we were worried. Um, the Cuban Missile Crisis was really close. I mean, and we've learned subsequently of all these little things where individuals made decisions, and if they had made the other decision, we could have easily spiraled into complete global catastrophe, and we didn't, so we got very lucky. Afterwards, people were freaked out. I think the military was freaked out. The leaders were freaked out. Relations between uh, the USSR and the U.S. improved. Um people did not wanted to avoid that sort of thing, which makes sense. And so the clock actually moved back. And um, there have been many cases along the way. The number of weapons it used to be 50,000 plus nuclear weapons. And now we're closer to 10,000. So that's a dramatic decrease over many decades due to treaties. Um, so that's great. That's progress. Uh, unfortunately, now the number of weapons is increasing. The treaties are all falling apart. There's only one treaty left, New START, which will expire in a few years. So we seem to be going back to a pretty dark place that way. But there, there's the past offers some signs of hope. You know, I don't, that's not quite where we are now, but, you know, we shouldn't become totally despondent. Thank you very much for that. I want to ask about the doomsday clock. Is there a way to calculate the risk or is it sort of subjective interpretation? Because from like economics, we know there's a very strong bad bias. So that bad news maybe is pushing people if it's subjective and not a calculated risk that it's leading that way. And I was also going to ask how much influence does it have? If it's already set at seven minutes, so the dramatic headline of 90 seconds to midnight, is it as influential to politicians or decision makers compared to with it was at six hours and then it moves to 90 seconds. Thank you. Yeah. So yeah, those are two good questions. So so for the you know issue of how we set it and is there an equation, there's no equation. Um we have you know a bunch of experts on various topics related to the clock. So people that study nuclear policy, people that study climate change, um, disinformation. Uh, we have, you know, political scientists and it's, it's a range and, and we discuss and everyone kind of talks about the sorts of scenarios that they're worried about, the things that give them hope. And we kind of come to a consensus. And although there really are disparate views and different, very different realms of expertise, we've been very effective at coming to a consensus. So, so it's it's not that I can argue we're at 90 seconds and not 91, like there's no, but but 90 seconds does capture, I would say, the feeling of these people who have spent, you know, many years thinking about these sorts of questions and what the risks are, the existential risks. 
and 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 you know you could disagree but um yeah, i think it, it, you wouldn't want to completely dismiss some of the arguments that are being used and so a big part of the time when we announce the time is we have a document where we explain why it's set at a particular time what gives us hope what we're worried about where things might change what people can do um and that is a very important part of the whole process and that's kind of related to your second question of does it matter and that's a harder question and i don't know i mean for sure when we set the clock we get some amount of attention and a lot of people, millions of people come to the website, read the statement, or at least download the statement. Um, it does enter the public discourse at some level. I, you know, this past time, um, the secretary general of the UN quoted the time, you know, this really, I think he said it's a, you know, this is a global alarm clock and we, you know, we should be worried, which we agree with. I mean, he, so, there's some impact, whether it helps, I, I don't know. If there are other things we could be doing, <laughs> let me know. I, I mean, it's one of these things where, uh, you know, we're all just trying. And, uh, we, you know, we think it's important, but it's, it's, you know, as much art as science. Well, and on that uplifting note, um, and given the hour, I think we can draw this uh, podcast to a close. Thanks so much, uh, Diana and Dan, for being on Why This Universe. And thank you all for coming for our very first live show. Thanks, Shalma, for doing this with me. Yeah. Not just today, but over the last few years. Uh, this has been great. Yeah. Thanks so much. Thank you. And we'll be over there. You can chat with us by the table outside. We have T-shirts. Yeah. We have books. All sorts of things. Totally. Thank, thank you. Thank yeah, you for thank doing you so this. Much. Yeah.